Well, she's a visiting professor at BYU. Dr. Radke was raised in Illinois and first came to Brigham University as an undergraduate in the late 1980s. After receiving her MA in 1995, Andrea served an LDS mission to a place I'm not go going to pronounce. It's in Brazil, to say that. Or in German, I could do it, but not in Spanish or Portuguese. Following her mission, she taught for Utah Valley State College and BYU Nauvoo program before deciding into the PhD program at University of Nebraska. Andrea focused on women's history in the West, particularly women in, women in life's work professions, school teaching, higher education, science, and domesticity. She's especially interested in how women's, women's students' entrance into higher education fit within larger gender patterns and interactions of the 19th and 20th century in America. Her dissertation studied women and land-grant universities of 1862 and 1917. As I said, she's a visiting professor at BYU, and at this time we'll turn the time over to Andrea Radke. I could talk in the one that doesn't work, that way you won't have to hear me, I guess. Um, I'm grateful to be here. I'm trying to think of ways to lessen my nervousness, and they suggest that you picture your audience naked, but I don't think I want to picture you people naked, so... Um, can you hear me okay? Can you, can you hear me fine? I'd like to first give a personal note of thanks to my family for being here, and also for individuals who I've been able to kind of bounce ideas off for the past three or four months as I've been working on this topic. It's been a great spiritual and emotional growth for me to work on this project on the topic of Mormon women. Um, and I'd like to thank Kylie Nielsen Turley. She's not here, but she's an individual who has uh, helped me uh, to a great deal with this project. Um, in dealing with this, because there are so many various directions that I could go, it was pretty daunting to kind of narrow it um, to certain areas, but I'll try to do my best. And whatever I don't cover today, I would encourage you to um, seek the published version of this paper, which will probably be much longer. Um, and it will, I'm sure, be on the FAIR website within a couple of months. So whatever I don't get to today, I'm kind of giving myself a little out if you don't get everything. Um, I'd like to begin with my paper. I actually have the paper organized with the help of a little bit of what I call Maxwellian, after Neil A. Maxwell, Maxwellian alliteration. So I have my paper divided into topics like perceptions, Prozac, polygamy, patriarchy, and priesthood. And then if I don't get to all of those, then you can, again, seek to get more specifics on, on my various topics. I, I like my Prozac topic, that's my favorite. Um, in the 19th century, Louisa Barnes Pratt, uh, some of you may know her as the wife of missionary Addison Pratt, boarded a train in Salt Lake City for a trip to the east. Other passengers showed interested reactions to her presence, and she remembered that, quote, as soon as it was announced that there were ladies from Utah in the car, a curiosity was at once excited. Some few there were who would shun me, Others were attracted, would draw near, and show a desire to converse. For those who especially wanted to debate the practice of plural marriage with her, Louisa attempted to engage in lively conversation, draw upon scriptural references, and finally bear her testimony. Not the silent, degraded Mormon woman of 19th century stereotypes, Louisa declared, I found it the better way to avoid argument as much as possible, but would testify boldly to what I knew to be true. Later on the same trip, Louisa met a Presbyterian clergyman who, upon learning that Louisa was from Utah, was, quote, very reserved and silent. She remembered, I could see prejudice in his eyes and on his knitted brow. Like she had done before, she attempted to disarm her critic. I took no trouble to draw him into conversation. This story and others like it speak to the pervasive misperceptions and misunderstandings leveled at Mormon women throughout the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. High-profile Mormon women spent much of the 19th century defending themselves to their critics, anti-Mormons, government leaders, first-wave feminists, and women suffrage activists, and from the many Save the Mormon Women societies that proliferated around the country in the latter part of the century. Much like Mormon women today, 19th century foremothers encountered great curiosity, criticism, and of course prejudice for their place as women in a patriarchal religion that openly practiced plural marriage. 
President Eliza R. Snow, at an 1870 indignation meeting in the Salt Lake Tabernacle, offered one of the most famous defenses of the status of her sisters, which rings as an appropriate response just as much today as it did in 1870. She said, Were we the stupid, degraded, heartbroken beings that we have been represented, silence might better become us. But as women of God, women who stand not as dictators but as counselors to their husbands, and who in the purest, noblest sense of refined womanhood, being truly their helpmates, we not only speak because we have the right, but justice and humanity demand that we should. Today, Mormon women continue to battle the misperceptions and stereotypes attached to them by critics of patriarchal priesthood leadership and traditional gendered spheres that seemingly limit choice. I have attended numerous academic conferences where colleagues have wondered, how can you be a thinking, more, thinking woman who accepts Mormonism? And on one occasion, when told that I teach women's history at BYU, one colleague reacted with surprise. Do they allow that? Meaning some kind of Orwellian they, some kind of big brother that doesn't allow teaching of women's history at BYU. Although the official church has discontinued polygamy, outsiders' criticisms of Mormon women have continued to link a culture of polygamy with so-called oppression, particularly in Utah. Following the 2002-2003 Elizabeth Smart kidnapping and rescue, various journalists tried to show exaggerated connections to a culture of male-dominated polygamy that made Elizabeth either unwilling or psychologically unable to attempt escape from her captors. Reflecting poor journalistic integrity, these reporters only cited interviews of women on the fringes of Mormonism, either disaffected Mormon feminists or minority fundamentalist polygamists who are not associated with the official church. As recently as last week, on July 26, 2004, Bill O'Reilly of Fox News linked the Elizabeth Smart kidnapping with Lori Hacking's recent disappearance. And he said, Salt Lake City is getting quite a reputation, women and girls disappearing. It's all very strange. While these sources and reports may feed into readers' desires for anti-Mormon sensationalism, they do not speak to the complete picture of practicing and believing Mormon women's experiences. Negative perceptions of Mormon women have become even more pronounced in recent years, where second-wave feminist awareness has brought greater attention to gender issues in the church. Especially since the 1970s, divisions have occurred over the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, female exclusion from priesthood leadership, prayer to Heavenly Mother, and women working outside the home. As other religions have attempted to reform their traditional patriarchies to include female leadership and even ordination, Modern critics question how Mormon women would voluntarily participate in a part patriarchal religion. Much examination of Mormon women's status has viewed the female experience through the lens of victimization and objectification. And for those of us faithful Mormon women, we wish to retake possession of our identity and our image from those who have robbed it from us. Are these misperceptions justified? Well, it is to be true. Since the earliest days of the church, Mormon women have presented a great paradox to outsiders. On the one hand, polygamy and patriarchal leadership have depicted women as degraded objects of men's power. On the other hand, Mormon women have had early access to suffrage, healing power, religious ceremonies, autonomous leadership in relief society, and access to coeducation when much of the nation still struggled to accept this progressive idea. The contradictions of Mormon women's experiences continue to plague feminists, both, both inside and outside of the church, religious critics and scholars, and some Mormon women themselves. Today's Mormon women attempt to balance their belief in a traditional religion while adapting and responding to the increasing pressure of gendered awareness demanded by a modern world. Perhaps Valerie Hudson has described this dilemma best. She said, despite the plainness of teachings by our prophet and our leaders, Practices and beliefs are found in our communities that are sometimes not e easily reconciled with the doctrine that God is no respecter of persons or of gender. Critics of our church see a sham of gender equality and assert that our, religious, our religion discriminates against women. However, believers strongly oppose this criticism, trusting the prophet when he proclaim, proclaims the equality of men and women before God. Yet the unbelievers ask questions that believers may find difficult to answer. How can one re reconcile gender equality in the gospel with the impression that men appear to have more power than women because of their ordination of the priesthood? How can one reconcile the early church practice of polygamy with equal valuation of men and women? And the questions go on. These questions elucidate a significant dualistic problem for women in the church today. One is the constant need to defend ourselves from outsiders' criticisms of women's place in the church. And the second is seeking ways to bring greater gender awareness within the culture 
especially where some unrighteous traditions and practices have perpetuated inequality. Regarding this twofold conflict for Mormon women, BYU law professor Cheryl Preston has drawn useful comparisons to women in other what she calls traditional or patriarchal religions, including Islam, Catholicism, Judaism, and Protestant Christianity, who have also felt secular feminist pressure to radically reform or outright reject their religions. Preston has responded, such critics don't speak to the breadth and depth of my experience. Furthermore, secular feminist frameworks are not useful in understanding how women in traditional religions view their own liberation and spiritual gender equality. Although there may be some individuals who, quote, in the name of religion abuse power, that certainly does not mean that the religion itself or its members generally are sexist, or for that matter, that any thinking woman would recoil from Mormonism. And then Preston asks, Am I less of a feminist because I am deeply, deeply religious and devoted to this traditional, conservative, organized religion? And of course, the answer is no. In response to increasingly tense debates over women in religion, Preston has suggested how American and secular feminists, as outsiders to religions, countries, and cultures, might help women in their struggle for empowerment and respect without arrogance or insensitivity. Further, Preston warns secular feminists to avoid the, quote, age-old traps of arrogance, racism, imperialism, and maternalism, or in other words, speaking down to us and telling us that we're too oppressed to be able to save ourselves. Again, women seek ways of negotiating within their established institutions and not feeling forced to reject their religion because, quote, if the feminist message is posited in a strict polarity between feminism and traditional religion, making women think that they have to choose between the two, then many of the world's women will choose their religion. Here, Preston invites a useful comparison to Muslim women. Quoting from Muslim feminist Aziz al-Hibri, the majority of Muslim women who are attached to their religion will not be liberated through the use of a secular approach impro imposed from the outside. Feminist Farid Shahid also advised against making Muslim women reject the foundation of their faith. She says, a woman's movement needs to be perceived as rooted in the cultural reality of the society in which it operates. Discriminatory laws sanctified through Islam cannot be effectively countered with arguments which deny or discard Islam. In other words, don't make us reject our faith in the name of trying to liberate us from so-called female oppression. Rejection of a women's religious foundational framework will only create alienation and divisiveness. A woman who is a practicing member of a religious institution is inevitably going to be hesitant to accept advice from someone who does not understand her value system and her commitment to it. This paper is an admittedly apologist response to the question of Mormon women's so-called oppression, but it is by no means a simplistic response to those who have honestly struggled with real and perceived gender inequity in their church experiences, especially regarding patriarchy and priesthood, polygamy, ambiguities about Mormon female authority, and dictates about women's traditional domestic roles. Many faithful women might feel sympathy with Hudson, as an active Mormon woman, a mother, and a professor at BYU who experienced her own gender struggle in 1992 and 93, when, quote, for almost a year and a half, she walked around as if the skin of her body had been rubbed raw by sandpaper. Things she never noticed before, even little things, caused her agony of soul, unquote. I feel sorrow for the lament of some Mormon feminists, some who I know very well, who are disaffected and or excommunicated who have determined that, quote, the fight for women's equality in the Mormon church is over. Our efforts to change the institution, this is a quote, our efforts to change the institution have been almost fruitless. We haven't changed a thing. In fact, women's official status in the church is worse now than in the 60s and early 70s. We have no hope left. And that's from Vicki Stewart Eastman. While I do not share this attitude of response, I acknowledge the pain they have experienced in trying to rec reconcile the inequity, both real and, per and perceived. I also celebrate with the multitudes of Mormon women who have found reason to rejoice in their status of women of spirituality, familial strength, purity, and leadership in the church, in education, and in the world. We rejoice in personal revelation in the words of our female leaders like Ardeth Kapp, Sherry Du, Chieko Okazaki, Marie Hafen, Patricia Holland, Elaine Jack, and others who have reminded us of the immense power we possess as women of spiritual strength in a world of intense conflict and moral decay. We are also reminded by Jill Mulvader of the empowering and historical sisterhood of the Relief Society. And further, in few other religions can women find such a celebration of motherhood as they do in this church. Recent interest in the place of Mormon women is evidenced by the prolific numbers of publications that address Mormon women's history, 
The Story of the Relief Society, biographies of significant Mormon female figures, sister missionary work, polygamy, the nature of Eve, women's spiritual questions, sociological studies, and issues of importance to Mormon women like work, family, and education. And believe me, the publications are extremely prolific. To try and sort through everything that's been written about Mormon women in the last 20 years is, is like taking a graduate seminar twice, literally. Perhaps the best example of how women within the church have provided very differing interpretations of their own place within that church is the editorial battle that occurred in the Boston Globe in the fall of 2000. Supported by the signatures of 50 women, feminists Courtney Black and Maxine Hanks responded to President Gordon B. Hinckley's statement that, quote, I haven't found any complaint among our women. I'm sure there are a few, a handful somewhere who may be disaffected for one reason or another, but I've never seen any evidence of it, unquote. Black and Hanks answered, with all due respect to our remarkable 90-year-old church leader, we find his words unfathomable in the face of reality. Thus we write to correct a misconception repeatedly set forth by LDS church leaders in the media. Mormon women are not content, we do have complaints. Shortly following this editorial, Mormon feminist Elizabeth Dion offered a rebuttal to Hanks and Black that, quote, when one considers that the worldwide membership of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints exceeds 11 million, 50 signatures from around the world is an underwhelming show of support, unquote. Further, Dion expressed that she would be, quote, shocked if more than one in 50 Mormon women would be sympathetic to the views or methods of Hanks and Black, unquote. Instead, Dion has seen the institutional church as an inherently feminist organization that, especially for women in the international church, means, quote, teaching men to stop drinking, to become industrious, and to treat their wives and children with love and respect, unquote. Further, the church provides liberation to teenage girls by, quote, creating a supportive community that shields them from sexual predation until they have the maturity to make self-realizing decisions, unquote. In the face of such extreme divergence among feminist response, how does one attempt to answer outside critics' charges regarding women, Mormon women's so-called oppression? The answer should not divide women into the two camps of faithful women and, quote, those apostate feminists. Instead, I much prefer to approach this as a dialogue among women, each with individual methods of negotiation, acceptance or rejection, spiritual definition, and of course, feminism. As Dion herself noted in her editorial, feminism is in the eye of the beholder. No one has the right to dictate the form feminism will take for any individual organization. So long as women individually or within that organization feel that such feminine feminism meets their needs and fosters their growth as women, unquote. And while some women have chosen to leave the church entirely, others have chosen acceptance and celebration of their roles as women as defined by the church and by leaning on faithful negotiation rather than rebellious discontent. Not only will this study respond to misperceptions about Mormon women from without the church, it might also help what Valerie Hudson calls the multitudes of, quote, good faithful Latter-day Saint women who have at some point felt a certain amount of pain because they are not always able to articulate a coherent vision of how they stand as equals with men in the church and in the eternities, unquote. Thus the basic question boils down to, are Mormon women oppressed by the doctrines role, divisions caused by the ERA debate, and the purpose for higher education for women in the church? While I cannot possibly deal with all these, I'm offering my few basic categories for consideration in response, the Prozac polygamy alliteration. So I'll first deal with Prozac. <laughs> A widely publicized 1994 study claimed that Utah had the highest per capita female use of Prozac in the nation. Although the study itself was admittedly prob problematic, critics of the church are quick to cite the study's sensationalized conclusions as proof that Mormon women must suffer under the strains of patriarchy, early marriages, constant childbearing, and voiceless acceptance of male dominance. What this study failed to show are the complex factors that might affect the use of Prozac and other antidepressants. These include socioeconomic status, level of education, number of children, genetic factors determining predisposition to depression, religiosity or non-religiosity, even among Mormon women born into the faith who are non-practicing, if we're going to talk about the Utah demographic, counseling service that accompany medication, and the numbers of men who might also require medication and counseling. Further, the high percentage of Prozac use might reflect a greater awareness by leaders that encourages members to seek professional therapy. Topic: I visited a chat room for Mormon women on antidepressant medication. Of 64 postings over a two-month period, 
only three postings cited gender as a significant determinant in mental health issues, but each one of them also expressed a defensive attitude about whether being a Mormon women, woman actually exacerbated their depression. One woman asserted, quote, I believe that having depression, anxiety, bipolar, or other mental disorders do not make us weak women. There are countless researches done that show that we simply have a chemical imbalance in our brains. They also show that more often than, than not, it's genetic, unquote. One attributed LDS women's avoidance of alcohol and coffee to the need to control depression through medication and counseling. Quote, LDS women experience depression more acutely because they don't go out and get drunk to mask their pain. Another example is they don't drink coffee in the morning to minimize the fatigue that often accompanies depression, unquote. Instead of dwelling on so-called gender depression, chat participants focus more on perceptions of medication use, hormonal imbalances, genetic predisposition, non-gendered shared experience among those using antidepressants, difficulties overcoming stress, and the need for greater sympathy, greater sympathy and awareness by non-sufferers, both inside and outside of the church. Further, the recent outing of Mormon composer Michael McLean has brought attention to depression as an increasingly non-gendered issue in the church. Since 1994, many sociologists and historians have attempted to respond to the Prozac study with quantitative and qualitative research regarding contentment and mental health among Mormon women. Although difficult to quanti quantify, qualitative research regarding Mormon women's contentment has been useful in disregarding this Prozac stereotype, although journalists are still slow to pick up on the, those things that question the Prozac stereotype. In particular, sociologists Sherry Mills Johnson and Marie, Marie Cornwall at BYU have directly taken on misperceptions about Mormon women in depression. Cornwall's very prolific studies, and some of you may be familiar with Marie's work, it's very broad and extensive, have shown that Mormon women's life satisfaction issues are much more complex than stereotypical portrayals of the submissive and degraded female. Um, although Cornwall has also shown that Mormon women tend to have a higher depression rate than Mormon men do, but that also could be tied into um, other complex factors. More recently, Sherry Johnson's 2004 study determined that LDS women are less likely to be depressed than American women in general and show no major differences in overall life satisfaction compared to women nationwide. By comparing a 1992-94 survey of over 3,000 non-LDS women and two national surveys of over 2,000 LDS women, Johnson made successful comparisons regarding life satisfaction, contentment, and measurements of depression and self-esteem. In terms of criteria such as residence, work, friendship, health, family life, and financial situation, she found, quote, there were no statistically significant differences in response between Mormon women and not LDS women. Further, although, quote, traditional women's roles involved with marriage and homemaking have long been cited as part of the reason for the purported depression, still, interestingly enough, national women were three to four times as dissatisfied with their work as Mormon women. Although Mormon women scored 10% lower on self-esteem rankings than non-LDS women did, Johnson suggested that the findings could be a reflection of the higher standards that are espoused by the church and also uh, Mormons' tendency to uh, against pride and not wanting to brag. However, LDS women claim to only suffer from general depressive symptoms on average one day a week, whereas non-LDS women experience depressive symptoms one and a half days per week. Further, 62% of returned missionary women and 52% of non-returned missionary women in LDS culture claimed happy marriages, as opposed to only 38% of non-LDS women. Although these findings should significantly alter, quote, the characterization of LDS women as more depressed than others, unquote, still, the debate continues as to why antidepressant sales are high in Utah. According to Johnson, to date, no conclusive evidence has been presented that proves that LDS women are more depressed or take more antidepressants than other women. Instead, Johnson stands by the most significant finding of her study that, quote, in, quote increased religiosity predicted increased life satisfaction and mental well-being. This is supported by sociologists of other religions who have also found comparative uh, conclusions and a link between religious practices or involvement and better mental and physical health, as well as reduced criminal activity among youth." Unquote. Stacy Huck's Christiansen and Janice Johnson have further examined the valuable connections between religiosity and contentment. Johnson constructed an email survey and received responses from more than 750 women of different ages, education levels, and marital status. 
On a scale between 1 and 10, with 10 reflecting the highest level of contentment, the average rating was 8.7. Only 50 women rated their contentment between 1 and 5 on that scale, and 724 between 6 and 10. Johnson further examined women's diverse written responses that accompanied their numerical rankings and discovered similar findings to Christiansen's 1997 thesis on Mormon women and empowerment. Some of you may be familiar with her thesis. Both Johnson and Christiansen determined that Mormon women who feel empowered have successfully negotiated a strong sense of well-being and contentment even within the structure of a patriarchal religion. Women in both studies express satisfaction in belonging to a religion that values, quote, traditionally female characteristics and experiences which generally stood in contrast to their perceptions of how the world sees traditional female experiences. Particularly for convert women, they felt a great contrast between their self-worth before conversion and greater sense of personal value and esteem following their conversion. One convert noted, Since joining the church at the age of 24, I have gained an understanding of my true potential and calling in life. As a wife and mother, as a daughter of God, being able to leave behind the idea that a woman is worthless unless she can compete with a man in the business world has been very liberating and satisfying to me. It feels right to be where I am and to be doing what I am doing now. I have also felt equality within the church that I didn't outside the church. Many women cited greater access to spiritual power opportunities for service and development, development and growth that came with church callings. Others referred to the church's higher regard for motherhood as extremely empowering, since Mormon women, quote, perceive that motherhood is undervalued in society at large, yet in contrast, the church validates their perception of the import of a mother's role, unquote. Finally, most women cited the faith and knowledge of their divine purpose as empowering or being taught and internalizing for myself that I'm truly a daughter of God, said one respondent. Christiansen's thesis outlined findings similar to Johnson's regarding women's empowerment within a patriarchal religion. She hypothesizes that, quote, within any patriarchal religion, the presence of women seeking empowerment has potential for intense conflict. Yet I hypothesize that there are women within this order who feel empowered because of the values that the church places on traditional female characteristics and because of the sense of connection that LDS women feel towards other LDS women, their ecclesiastical leaders, and family members. The fact that some women have been able to empower themselves within the patriarchal su system suggests several things. First, it undermines popular notions of patriarchy as inherently destructive or as only capable of oppression. It also presents a more complex picture of the society that patriarchy creates. In the lives of these women whose marginal status should make them casualties of the system, it may be the very characteristic of patriarchy that have facilitated their empowerment. Christiansen separates Mormon women's experiences into three categories the empowered, as she calls them, the unempowered, um, and the largest group, those processing empowerment. Of her whole sample, 24% had experienced depression, and all of those that had experienced depression had sought some form of professional help. For Christiansen, the most significant category included the majority of her women respondents who were processing empowerment, or those working through the empowerment process through personal belief and faith, personal revelation, and relationships with family and ecclesiastical leaders. Christiansen cites various factors that affected women's sense of empowerment, which included the occurrence of life-altering experiences, personal belief systems, personal, the idea of personal progression, and faith in, in God, and the ability to challenge belief systems that don't match individual experiences. Other factors included education level, knowledge of doctrine, return missionary status, work experience, experiences in church leadership positions, and age. Quote, because the younger the woman, the more empowered she will feel because her culture has validated the experience of women, and she would have grown up with the questions and answers from previous generations of women who challenge traditional gender issues. In other words, for those of us of the younger generation, sometimes it's a little easier because the battles were fought earlier, and now we're benefiting from the fruits of some of the battles. In conclusion, Mormon women do not suffer from depression on any significantly greater level than their national counterparts. Further, any qualitative assessment of life satisfaction needs to reject monolithic stereotypes of women's so-called tendency to depression and instead reflect diverse factors such as age, education, genetics, and access to counseling service and support networks. Like women in other patriarchal religions who have felt happiness and contentment because of their relationship with God and their sense of divine purpose, Mormon women have, quote, found solace, inspiration, nurturance, sustenance, and spiritual growth, unquote. Next I'll move on to polygamy, and we'll see if we can get through that in 15 minutes. 
Polygamy remains one of the most controversial issues surrounding the historical LDS church and the place of Mormon women within that religious culture. In spite of church leadership's attempts to distance itself from its polygamous past, outsiders' historical memory remains remarkably sharp on this point. Perhaps what most plagues the church is a continued association with modern polygamy by journalists, historians, feminists, and many documentary, documentary filmmakers. If any of you are fans of A&E, they're constantly having some documentary regarding polygamists in Utah. Uh, further, the continued practice of polygamy by so-called fundamentalist or fringe groups in Utah and throughout the West brings greater attention to the legacies of 19th century polygamy for the mainstream church population in Utah. The issue begs two important questions of consideration, polygamy in the past and polygamy in the present. First, how could the church have practiced something perceived by the outside world as so demeaning to women? Second, why does a predominantly Mormon political leadership in Utah currently look the other way in regards to prosecution of Utah's anti-polygamy laws? Many historians have sought to go beyond attempts at reductionism and stereotype by instead examining the complexity of polygamous practice for, 19th century, for the 19th century church and also turning to the voice of the women themselves. Much to the disappointment of observers then and today, according to Richard Van Wagner, contrary to popular 19th century notions about polygamy, the Mormon harem, dominated by lascivious males with hyperactive libidos, did not exist. Historical research has quite successfully exposed many of the misconceptions, stereotypes, and realities of 19th century polygamy. Although some Mormon believers might be dismayed to discover the extent of discontentment and unhappiness Mormon wives admitted in private, still many Mormon critics are just as disappointed to discover the admitted happiness, political and financial independence, and shared congeniality of sister wives. Then, just as today, the image of unlimited lust was largely the creation of travelers to Salt Lake City more interested in titillating audiences back home than in accurately portraying plural marriage. Because polygamy was dedicated to, quote, propagating the species righteously and dispassionately, plural marriage, quote, proved to be a rather drab lifestyle compared to the imaginative, imaginative tales dripping with sensationalism demanded by the scandal-hungry Eastern media market, unquote. Even reporter Rebecca Johnson admitted disappointment in 2003 on her Vogue article about Elizabeth Smart. She admitted disappointment when the polygamous wives that she interviewed did not confess to sharing the same bed with their husband all at the same time. Sensationalism continues to feed American public's desires for exotic sexuality associated with Mormon culture. Historians have also examined the many complex aspects of polygamous practice, including the purposes for the realities of domestic living, the contentment felt by some wives, and the immense depression and disappointment felt by others. Indeed, the historical realities of polygamous practice transcend any monolithic descriptions by either Mormon apologists or sensationalist critics. As I often tell my students, just like monogamous marriages, there were good polygamous unions, defined by love and respect, and bad ones, defined by abuse and loneliness. There were also practical economic marriages, non-sexual unions, marriages of convenience, marriages to teenagers and widows, and a significant number of divorces, a distinctly progressive practice in marital law, especially within the context of anti-divorce attitudes in 19th century America. To understand Mormon polygamous practice, most historians agree on the necessity to separate marital ideology from 19th century ideals of romantic companionate marriage. Instead, polygamy was directly related to a commandment to raise and nurture children in righteous homes. Divorced from these 19th century ideals about romantic love, Mormon ideology accepted polygamy as a commandment necessary for bringing righteous spirits into the world and raising them as part of the kingdom of God. Historians have brought attention to the complexity of determining the numbers of polygamous relationships. Catherine Danes and Richard Van Wagener have elucidated the demographics of plural marriages, estimating that somewhere between 20% and 40% of Mormon families were polygamous in the 19th century, depending upon geographical location and decade. Van Wagener has cited Stanley Adams' 1956 study that showed that 66.3% married only two wives, 21.2% married three, 6.7% married four, and a scant 5.8% married five or more women. Dane's demographic studies of Manti, Utah show similar findings. She also makes it clear that, quote, a majority of Manti polygamists had only two wives at a time, although many had several wives over their lifetimes, but often not at the same time. These statistics appear to represent church-wide marital statistics and show that the stereotype of large Mormon harems was a historical rarity. 
Although most 19th century members clearly defined celestial marriage as plural wifery and necessary for salvation, according to the Doctrine and Covenants, some members and even a few leaders remained monogamous. Apostle and First Presidency Counselor to two prophets, Anton H. Lund, remained monogamously married to his wife, Sarah Ann Peterson, as a condition of their engagement that he would never take another wife. Monogamy did not preclude Lund from, Lund from achieving positions of authority in the church. Historians have also in the modernization and Americanization of the church. Historian Thomas Alexander has demonstrated that not until the mainstream church repudiated polygamy first in 1890 and finally in 1904 did convert numbers in the East and in Europe significantly begin to grow and the church's image begin to successfully internationalize. So how do Mormon women reconcile a historical and doctrinal past so clearly linked to the importance of polygamous marriage as a requirement for salvation? Perhaps Valerie Hudson has offered the most lucid explanation that polygamy was the exception to the rule of monogamy, commanded in specific times for the purposes of raising children and creating a unique and unified bond among members. And although celestial marriage, as defined by the Doctrine and Covenants, was clearly interpreted by 19th century Mormons to mean plural marriage, Today, most, American, most Mormons accept an interpretation of celestial marriage doctrine to mean the priesthood sealing of one man and one woman. Then, celestial marriage can have two possible principles or applications, if you call them, either monogamous celestial marriage as the rule, or polygamous celestial marriage as the exception when directed by God. Observers outside of Utah see the state as a place where polygamy is still tacitly accepted by Utah legislators, predominantly members of the LDS Church who have either neglected law enforcement or prosecution in this area. But the reasons for laxity on polygamy enforcement in Utah are much more complex than some sensationalist picture of Utah as a fringe fundamentalist state. As Martha Bradley has shown, prosecution often leads to greater problems like displaced children and wives as wards of the state, difficulties proving polygamous cases, and usually very damaging public relations fiascos. For instance, the 1953 Short Creek raids backfired as photos of crying children being torn away from parents were published in newspapers. And also women and children were photographed with numbers hung around their necks, um, suggestive of some kind of genocidal rounding up. In fact, the 1953 Short Creek raids were so damaging to Utah and Arizona public relations. No anti-polygamy prosecutions were brought by the state of Utah until the 2001 Tom Green case. Some accused Utah of capitalizing on the Green case in the midst of Olympic attention in order to soften its fundamentalist and polygamist image. Since Green's case, however, state prosecutors have felt greater pressure to enforce child sex laws and welfare fraud. Recent attention to incest, child marriages, and even recently sexual abuse of young boys in the Jeffs clan, as some of you may be aware of, has added to pressures on the legislature to prosecute felony child abuse cases in polygamous clans. Hopefully, the state of Utah will find better ways to prosecute these crimes while still respecting the marital privacy of consenting adults. In most outright polygamy cases, state officials maintain the difficulty of prosecution because of ambiguous documentation and the separationist culture of some groups. Any raid of these groups has the potential of a short creek outcome, or even worse, a possible Waco ending. Furthermore, the reality of polygamy within the American legal structure has received new attention in recent years since legal theorists have suggested the possibility of the overturning of anti-polygamy rulings by the Supreme Court in the 19th century, particularly as they were violations of constitutional guarantees to the free practice of religion. Groups like the Liberation Front and even the American Civil Liberties Union have weighed in on the side of, free, of the freedom of, of polygamous practice. Polygamy discussions have reached international proportions as immigrant groups from the Middle East and Africa bring parts or all of their polygamous family structures to the United States with the desire for legal familial recognition. The debate is, or should be, no longer related to outdated attempts as at, at anti-Mormon persecution. Rather, it is becoming more about adapting to world cultures, freedom of religious practice, and immigrant rights in the new global culture and also the immense hypocrisy of outsiders' criticisms of polygamous relationships as they exist in Utah, while at the same time embracing non-monogamous sexuality in the media, the Playboy Mansion, and even high levels of political offices. For the purposes of Mormon relations to polygamy, it must clearly be stated that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does not endorse, condone, or sanction the earthly practice of plural marriage, but the relationship of a predominantly Mormon and non-polygamous culture and the between 30,000 and 70,000 polygamists in Utah is much more complex. The church officially supports the anti-polygamy group Tapestry Against Polygamy, made up of women who have escaped from polygamous relationships, 
and which offers sanctuary and relief stuffs to women and children who have escaped from abusive marriages and homes. And yet the Mormon-dominated state government is, willing to, is unwilling to, excuse me, is willing to set aside anti-polygamy enforcement and prosecution because of much needed law enforcement resources elsewhere. And these include the increasing gang violence in Utah urban areas, drug trafficking, and methamphetamine production. And Governor Levitt admitted to this. The resources are simply not there to prosecute all of the polygamists, especially with all of the resulting uh, public relations fiasco and the number of children that would become wards of the state if this prosecution did occur. Regarding the future of the church's doctrinal relationship to polygamy, it seems unlikely that polygamy will ever be reinstated as an earthly institution, even if the Supreme Court were to reverse, reverse the anti-polygamy rulings of the 19th century. The risk for more negative hype is simply too great. And regarding the church's continued cultural associations with polygamy, those are unlikely to subside either because of the church's historical past. However, the continued proliferation of anti-polygamy sensationalist journalism is entirely dependent upon journalists themselves and their willingness to reject tabloid reporting in favor of honest, factual, and objective portrayals of the complexity of modern polygamous practice. So there's that. Did that sound preachy? Okay. Um, I, have a, I have about five minutes left, and I have a whole section on uh, priesthood and patriarchy, which I'd encourage you all to read on the website, and so I'll skip ahead to my, my conclusion. Depending upon what framework for judgment is applied, it can be easy to interpret the church's experience and history as misogynistic and oppressive, as some critics have claimed. However, for myself, and for many others with whom I'm acquainted, we seek to recognize where cultural changes have occurred over time, and many still might need to occur, but to ultimately acknowledge that the gospel itself is the source of our liberation and feelings of empowerment. If we did not see it that way, then we would not choose to stay, period. We are not sellouts. Daily and weekly, we see so many examples of gendered sharing that give us cause to hope and reason for reinforcement of our belief in this faith as the ultimately empowering faith. Like many women in the church, we see ourselves as Mormons who happen to be women rather than women who happen to be Mormons. This is an important distinction since we find our liberation in the atonement of Jesus Christ which offers us hope for redemption and eternal life regardless of our gender. Our faith allows us direct access to God through personal revelation, prayer, and a relationship with Christ's atoning grace and individual application of scriptures. Furthermore, I know of few religions who promise godhood in the next life as our religion does. I'd like to quote from, of course, a famously quoted Mormon woman who says, the impact of righteous, determined, pure-hearted women today is immeasurable. It doesn't matter where you live, whether or not you have children, how much money you have, or how talented you think you are or aren't. This kingdom need women who are firmly grounded in their testimony of Jesus Christ, women of vision who have their sights trained on the purpose of life, women who can hear the voice of the Lord, expose the distractions of the adversary for what they are, and press forward with a sense of purpose and a desire to contribute. Women who are articulate as well as compassionate. Women who understand who they are and where they're going and are determined to not let anything keep them from getting there. Good women all over the world are desperate for leadership, for role models, for the assurance born out of lives, born out in lives will live, that families are important, that virtue is not outdated, and that it is possible to feel peace and purpose in a society spinning out of control. We have reason to be the most reassured, the most determined, the most confident of all women. In saying this, I don't minimize our personal disappointments, but we know what we're here for, and we know that we are beloved of the Lord. And finally, to those who have not been able to reconcile their feelings of perceived or real gender inequity in the church, I echo the plea of Linda Hoffman Kimball, who said, I have seen in recent years many of the church's best and brightest bailing out or being forced to bail. This is a cause of great heartbreak and loneliness. Here is my advice to those who are considering this route. To the extent that you have been affected and have a say in the matter, don't go. Don't go, if for no other reason than I need you. As for me, I have seen the deep image, felt that pulse, that divine juice beneath the sometimes majestic and sometimes morbid details on the surface of church experience. But I have seen, I am tethered to this place whether I like it all the time or not. I remain here by choice, by commitment, and by covenant. Thank you. Is that a song to sing? You started a vacation. Where you sing?